Uh, my name is Madhu Rangarajan. I'm a senior principal engineer, and I run the product portfolio strategy in the cloud and enterprise solutions group at Intel. And I'm going to talk about how you simplify the journey to cloud with Intel. And I'm going to spare, I'm going to talk a lot about breadth, and, and I'm actually going to be all over the place a bit, but intentionally so because that's where our customers are, right? Now, our customers aren't just in the cloud; they're in the cloud, they're on-prem, they're on the edge. Uh, they aren't just running one workload; they're running many workloads. So I'm going to be all, I'm going to be a little bit all over the place and set the stage for why that matters, why being able to do a lot of things really well is useful. And then I'm going to talk about competition a little bit, and I hope it'll be fun. <clears throat> so, I mean, just setting the stage first. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen foils like this, so I'm going to run through these quickly. But uh, if you look at the digital world, world, right, whether it's an enterprise data center, whether it's a cloud data center, or it's a small business, <clears throat> or whether it's the intelligent edge, uh, Intel's all over the place. And we, we continue to invest in technologies uh, across all of these so HPC clusters and so on, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we kind of navigate most of the critical technology transitions, right? And we've been there for most of these technology transitions, whether it's virtualization, whether it's IoT, whether it's transformation of the network with NFV, <clears throat> uh, all of the things happening in AI, with AI becoming ubiquitous everywhere, right? Uh, security, you can see all of the different features we're enabling there from cloud to edge. So we've been there for all of these technology transitions, and we've been there as trusted partners. We've been there as uh, folks who work with the ecosystem, work with ISVs, work with uh, OXMs to make sure customers are actually able to consume all of these technologies we have. And that's also going to be a recurring theme of my talk. <clears throat> now, if you look at the Intel technologies for cloud, and I'm going to hone in on cloud today, right? I know we have Edge and we have HPC and we have a bunch of others, but today I'm going to hone into cloud. Uh, the theme we have is it's real. It's no longer just about the compute because anyone in the cloud is actually running an application where you have folks com connecting from over the network, connecting into the data center, and then it's all about moving faster. It's all about storing more. It's all about processing everything. You've seen all of our executives talk about this theme, right? So we are going to look at everything at a portfolio level. <clears throat> We're going to uh, we have our Ethernet portfolio with our NICs, and I'm sure you have seen the recent discussions on the uh, IPU. Uh, I think the, in the industry tends to call it DPU, but we think it's an IPU, an infrastructure processing unit, where a lot of the infrastructure workloads, like networking and storage, are running. So, and then we have silicon photonics because as you build these bigger and bigger data centers. You want to have a flat network. You want to have a flat network with minimal latencies. And so you want the switch to switch interconnects to be as low latency and as high bandwidth as possible. So Intel Silicon Photonic uh, plays a really big role in that. And of course, the switch itself, where Intel's making inroads with a lot of the big hyperscalers with the Tofino switch. <clears throat> in terms of store more, uh, we just had a really good talk on opt-in. And that's a, a critical part of us uh, storing more. And whether, whether it's databases or whether it's high performance storage, there are, or whether it's lower cost memory as we expand on these usages. Uh, so that's a critical part of our strategy. <clears throat> and of course, process everything. And when it comes to process everything, uh, it includes general purpose CPUs like Xeon, as well as much more specialized things like we have Mobidius to do edge AI, we have Habana to do data center level AI. We got our GPUs for a broad set of data parallel workloads like HPC and AI and graphics and so on. So, and all of these, this is not just about a hardware view, right? This is about a portfolio of products that are optimized uh, at a system level and with software that ties things together. So I, I won't belabor the specifics there, but I'm sure you've heard of one API. I'm sure you've heard of our uh, discussions on the IPU and how we plan to like do IPDK to tie those software stacks together. So there's lots of uh, the other talks on those software stacks, but our goal is to actually tie it all together. And I believe that's the value we bring, whether you run in a public cloud or a private cloud, or whether you're running across multiple clouds, we want to give that commonality of experience. <clears throat> and I'm going to skim through this really quickly. So the benefits are flexibility because we, have a, uh, we are able to run a vast diversity of workloads and we have many products to serve each of those workloads needs. 
We can provide predictable performance, and we've worked with customers extensively on this, right? We've had good quality of service features like the resource director technology and so on. Efficiency, right? We again work with cloud service providers and a rich set of telemetry features. We make sure that we can allow them to utilize your servers as highly as possible. We support such a broad variety of workloads on our servers that you don't have to buy 15 different types of servers to run 15 different workloads. Uh, our CPUs tend to be pretty good at a broad set of workloads, which allow you to maximize your infrastructure utilization. And then of course, security, right? We have, uh, we're making inroads there with SGX and uh, growing that over the future. Uh, and we also make sure we are, we are enabling that through ISVs and OEMs. <clears throat> and again, just going to skim through this again, uh, and I'm going to spend more time on the later files, which have some data. Uh, but we also going to ha have flexibility and choice for workload placement, right? I go to any enterprise. Uh, they don't want to run their workload in one place. Rather, they want to be able to run their workload on their data center. They may want to deploy it on an edge location, or they want to deploy it across multiple CSPs. And one of the things that we work really hard on is to make sure that we are keeping that uh, consistency and compatibility across all of these, whether you rent an, a VM at AWS or whether you're deploying a virtual machine on-prem or whether you're renting an edge VM instance, uh, the software stack or a container you download that runs in one location will run in the other location, right? And that's the ubiquity, I think, that the huge trends and something to think about as people make infrastructure choices. Well, quick question though. I, I, some of the architectural requirements seem to be changing and we're seeing increased adoption of non-X86, especially in the cloud. So how does Intel plan to address that? Uh, that's actually what I will be jumping into and hopefully it'll be a fun conversation. Uh, but that's exactly where the ubiquity and the performance across a broad set of workloads is going to matter, right? And that's what I'm going to highlight some specific examples of, and we can talk through that if you want to hold your thought and we can jump, jump into the details. Sure. Hopefully by the end of this, I make the case for why. And again, I'm starting to jump right into that here, right? The cost of heterogeneous infrastructure, right? Um, 98% of organizations revalidate application after they change the underlying infrastructure, right? Uh, and 73% do a much more extensive revalidation. So when you make an infrastructure choice and want to make a decision to, well, I'm using Intel VMs today, I want to switch to using, say, ARM VMs, something to think about is the cost of that revalidation. <clears throat> uh, the second is uh, the not just the revalidation, but the re-architecture of the applications themselves. So that's the second box. So 64% of customers discover that applications need to be re-architected after infrastructure changes. And this is not like just, uh, oh, the ISA changed, so I need to recompile the code. It also comes down to the micro-architecture. For example, if you have a shared, uh, unified uh, last level cache versus a split L3, that'll have uh, performance differences that you may now need to re-architect and retune, right? So, it, it, so the changing the infrastructure, changing the microarchitecture means you may need to think about re-architecting your application. <clears throat> um, and 49% of organizations have hardware incompatibilities after changing the infrastructure, right? And 82% of organizations say, said they would re, re, rethink how they do things when it comes to infrastructure changes based on recent experience. So I think the thing here is, uh, when you change, pick your infrastructure, um, the capex, right, the cost, whether it's real hardware, like what's the cost of the server, or whether it's the cost of a VM. Hey, VM Y is twenty percent cheaper than the uh, Intel VM. Uh, that's only such a small portion of the cost, right? Uh, there are so many other criteria to measure success, and we'll keep talking about that through the talk, like performance, and not performance as measured by something synthetic like spec and grade. Uh, performance across a broad set of workloads and a mix of that workload can actually vary over time. Uh, reliability, uh, scalability, where if you have a workload that takes a small number of cores or the workload takes a large number of cores, how well is it going to perform? Uh, and the cost of software porting and so on. So uh, all of those matter when you pick your infrastructure. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk a little bit about the performance and I'm going to little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the cost and performance. And I'm going to touch only the surface today because there are so many examples, but I'm happy to deep dive later if anyone's interested. Hey, sorry, I have 
I have many doubts about uh, what you explained here. I mean, uh, if I think about uh, ARM uh, instances are in the cloud, for example, yeah. just to make one, okay, mm -hmm. I choose that instance because, you know, it's not about revalidation of any of this stuff. I mean, I am already in the cloud. I have uh, mm -hmm. probably open source software. I have uh, many of these. I, I test if it goes better. And if the price... Uh, performance works well for me. Yes. Then I do it. I mean, it's it's not it's not about. Uh, I mean, all this. So where is all this continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery kind of stuff that we talk about? I mean, it works. I could implement and tune later if necessary. Probably yeah. not. <laughs> and another thing that. You know, this goes against what you said one moment ago about accelerators. I mean, I'm offloading a lot of stuff to accelerators. So if my accelerator remains an NVIDIA GPU, I mean, who cares about the CPU? Because most of the work in my AI workload is made by NVIDIA anyway. So why should I care too much? I mean, uh, in the end, th th there is something, I mean, I don't know where these data come from, but but actually, uh, I would be curious to know more about you know the uh, who was interviews and what they want to move. Of course, that if you want to move uh, SAP Anna, mm -hmm. okay, but if you want to move uh, I don't know Kafka, maybe yeah. there's a, a Kafka already optimized, ready to go on Ubuntu for ARM. Yeah. Uh I think you're making a very fair point on, say, enterprise applications, which tend to have a lot of these dependencies versus, say, more cloud-native applications, which are using runtimes, which are a little easier to port. Uh, I think the porting is one thing, but the tuning is another thing when it comes to performance. So that's something we'll talk about in a little bit. And you are absolutely right about the price performance, and we'll actually get into some specific numbers later on. Um, and uh, what, the case I'll make is, yeah, if you look at the price performance as measured by some standard benchmarks, uh, they look different from if you measure price performance based on some more realistic workloads. And again, we'll look at some specific examples if you can hold your thought right there. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm going to skip this again. So compatibility from on-prem to edge, I think I touched upon that uh, earlier, right? And these are just specific examples, right? Uh, you have 250 instance types in AWS and 260 in Azure, and you have a bunch of instances at GCP. You have a bunch of edge solutions that have Intel, like either it's Azure Stack or Anthos or Outpost. And then for hybrid, you got all of these enterprise stacks from VMware and SAP HANA that are available both on the cloud and on-prem for you to be able to move seamlessly across the enterprise and the cloud. Now let's start jumping into some of that data, right? So. When you're trying to pick something for your infrastructure, um, you're now, you, you have a diverse set of workloads. Now, like consider any typical web application, right? Any digital services application, whether it's shopping or whether it's social media or something like that. You're first going to have to get through a load balancer. And then maybe there's SSL termination, or if it's like a, connecting to a VM, there may be a VPN termination. Uh, you're going to have web tier and memcache which is probably going to be a pretty big bulk of your fleet. Uh, you're going to do AI inference. And to your point, right, uh, where are you doing the AI inference? So AI, I think you brought up that, okay, for AI, am I using NVIDIA? But the reality is there's a hierarchy of acceleration for AI, right? In some cases, you're just using pure software. In some cases, you're using software accelerated with specific instructions like AVX 512 or, uh, um, or VNNI or DL Boost, like we call it. Uh, in some cases, you're actually accelerating with something like an NVIDIA accelerator or a Habana accelerator or some other accelerator. Uh, AI actually is done all of those ways. A lot of AI does continue to get done on the CPU, uh, especially inference, right? Because inference, uh, if you want to do inference on a streaming request that has come in, it usually doesn't make sense to send it over to an accelerator, wait for the response and so on. That overhead of the acceleration often is uh, not worth the effort. So a lot of inference, especially when it comes to recommendation systems and so on, tends to get done in the CPU. And there's a lot of acceleration within the CPU for those uh, types of AI operations. Then you have uh, search clusters, right? Any application, you're going to connect to the web tier. You're going to kind of 
uh, it, it runs some inference to figure out uh, what kind of recommendations to make for you. And then you're going to click on something based on that. And maybe it's going to pull up a list for you. So search is a ubiquitous thing. And then so our databases and scale out storage. So when you're trying to make an infrastructure decision, you're kind of looking across all of these. And then you're trying to decide, uh, should I buy 10 different types of systems that excel just a specialize in these 10 different things? Uh, should I buy two or three different kinds of systems that are uh, pretty good at, uh, across all of these? Maybe you make trade-offs in one of these workloads, you do better in another workload. So it's a complex decision, right? When you have to pick infrastructure and it's not usually just based on one workload or one benchmark like spec and trade. And that's kind of the a theme of why we think you use Intel is if you look across all of these workloads, let's pick load balancing, right? Um, we have DDIO in our CPU. Your DDIO is when a packet comes in from the network, uh, you don't have to let it go to memory before you can use that packet. You can place it in the last level cache and whatever application needs access to the data can access it directly out of that last level cache. And that's an extremely useful feature for all sorts of networking applications where you can avoid all of that latency to main memory. And I think what you can see is with Intel DPDK, you get 1.3x higher L3 packet forwarding by just enabling this feature. And one of the micro architectural choices we made actually helps us do this, right? For example, we have a unified last level cache versus competition has a split L3. And having this unified last level cache allows us to do things like DDIO that helps with the networking applications. Then, and please stop me anytime if you have questions because I'll otherwise we'll keep rattling on. Uh, the second one is now let's talk about almost all web traffic is HTTPS. And so your web peer uh, and your uh, security kind of tend to go together there. A lot of the encryption also tends to get done with the web peer. So we have new AVX 512 instructions now to parallelize encryption functions. And I know one of the complaints about AVX 512 has been the frequency response, but I would encourage everyone to look at uh, how it is in Ice Lake where we have made great improvements to that. Uh, now, once you enable this, right? Now, at the end of the day, what does a web, uh, web server care about? How many connections per second can I do? And the connection per second is a combination of the regular scalar instructions that are going to be executed and the encryption that the web server has to do because everything's HTTPS. Once you put that encryption into the equation, you can get 4.2x more web connections per second on Nginx uh, if you uh, turn on the, if you make use of the optimized libraries that have this enabled. And, uh, and for VPNs, right? If you want to have a VPN server to terminate all of your connections before coming into your data center, for example, in the cloud, you can get 1.9 more, uh, 9x more encrypted packets per second. So more network and VPN capacity. So that kind of talks about the whole networking web and crypto. No, I'm and, just, and sure. So you're comparing these against what? Uh, the best uh, competitive solution out there? Is that, are you no. comparing against ARM? Are you comparing against, I'm so just trying this, to understand what the comparison is. Yeah, so in this case, the comparison is against, if you turn off that feature versus turning it on, right? It's not versus the competition. I'll get into some competitive comparison oh, okay. in a few points. I got you. Yeah. So yeah. um, I, do, I, I do have a question because what we're seeing now, we are talking about current capabilities, but of course the industry is evolving into a lot of things, you know? I mean, we're talking about full disaggregation. There's the Gen Z consortium of which I think Intel is not a member. I'm not a good person, sure. So mm -hmm. right now we see that the Xeon processor is kind of the core and we have all of these things which aggregate mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. But this kind of seems to go in a different way where we are seeing, you know, fully disaggregated architectures where all of these things will live on their own somehow somehow. So what is the strategy there going forward? Are you trying to consolidate everything and make like the, uh, like let's say the, the Xeon <clears throat> is going to remain kind of the golden knot, you know, of the of the whole thing which needs to be there for all to work together? Or are you going to be going towards a direction which is kind of fully disaggregated? I, I think the answer, unfortunately, is going to be both, which makes life very complicated. Because for example, right, if you are extremely large scale, and you have a huge volume of every <coughs> workload, then this disaggregated architecture can make more sense to an extent, right? You're not going to disaggregate everything. There's an extreme to which you can take, but you're going to disaggregate and pick like, I don't know, five, 10, 15 different uh, ways, the things that you disaggregate. 
Uh, at the same time, if your scale is small and you have a lot of uh, jitter on how much of a certain workload comes in, then you want something as more as general purpose as possible where you're good at multiple things. And I think that's where you're going to have a hierarchy of you have a CPU. It's going to be really you know, pretty good at everything, but excel at general purpose code. But when you have AI and other code come in, the CPU is going to be pretty good at it. And then the, the way I see it at the next level of the hierarchy for the applications is the GPU where, well, now I can run AI and HPC and graphics and other workloads. So more like a general purpose accelerator. And then uh, if I if I decide that, no, I have so much just AI workload that I want to specialize in AI and I don't, and I know how much AI workload comes in so I can strand that resource for AI, then maybe I'll go for a specialized accelerator like Habana. So uh, I think at the end of the day, the customers are go going to have to make a complicated choice, which is, do I want to create a stranded resource that is good only at one workload, which won't be useful if that workload comes in? Or do I provision more general purpose that's going to allow me to be flexible as my workload evolves? And I think the way our strategy is to actually design it for both. So if I can, if I can add to, the, to, to what you were saying, you were saying, you know, customers can make the choice, but, you know, customers have also mm -hmm. some kind of limit in terms of what they can do. At some point, they will not be able to, you know, yes. implement all of these kind of architectures. So maybe they will need to run mm -hmm. something on the cloud and, yep. and so on. And, and there, there's one point I had there, the, the Habana, for example, is that something which can run fully independently? Because the, the idea there is, uh, if I have only, uh, if I want to do only this kind of computation, mm -hmm. can I just go, let's say, for a cluster or whatever, which is running on the cloud or even on premises, which does just that, or do I still have this dependency on the on the Xeon processor? Uh, so Habana is kind of an add-in card, right? So it does have a dependency on Xeon, right? Or or any CPU for that matter. You have to just you have to plug it into a CPU, and it's a PCIe device. Now. In terms of the difficulty in supporting this diversity of architectures, right? one of the things we are trying to do is make sure, let's check AI as an example. Uh, most widely used frameworks are TensorFlow and PyTorch. right? And what we are trying to make sure is that the there is a distribution of TensorFlow and PyTorch available that works seamlessly across all of the Intel hardware targets, right? whether it's the CPU or the GPU or any of the specialized accelerators. So that's what we are trying to do is trying to make sure that from and so from a software perspective, you have a uniformity of what you need to download and what you need to run. And then you can make the hardware choice based on the dynamics of how much AI workload do you have versus other workloads. Uh, how jittery is that workload? Is it uh, suddenly, do you suddenly have a lot of general purpose work and then suddenly have a lot of AI, in which case maybe you want more general purpose infrastructure or is it more predictable where you know the ratio of general purpose to AI, where you can make a choice to say, you know, I'm going to deploy X number of accelerators because I know my ratios. That's the challenge. The challenge is, do you know your ratios or not? When you are at a hyper scale, you often tend to have better idea of the ratios and what you need to provision for. When your scale is smaller, you tend to err more on general purpose. So we're, we also make sure that we are the best for general purpose where we can, you can run AI on a Xeon CPU and you will do a pretty good job. And uh, that's kind of the philosophy behind how we are trying to address this, uh, ar these architecture evolutions. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that helps get the context. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> now we go to AI inference, right? I think we added do a DL boost to our CPU. And again, depending on what algorithm you're asking for. And here I do have some comp comparison. Um, uh, on specific image recognition algorithms, DL boost actually can make you uh, 25 times faster than competition. But again, uh, instead of cherry picking just specific things we're good at, what we did is we took 20 popular AI and ML workloads, the combination of natural language processing, a recommend recommendation systems, image processing, and so on. And across all of those, we are about 50% better than competition on AI and ML workloads, right? and primarily driven by inference, which tends to be a bulk of what customers are running. 
Uh, and when it comes to search, right, graph analytics algorithms tend to be a pretty important part of uh, search. And again, going tying us back to the previous talk, right, this is another application of opt-in persistent memory. If you take advantage of the fact that it gives you much larger memory footprint that can be addressed using load stores, uh, you can get two times faster graph analytics on, on graph analytics algorithms for your search clusters. And then I won't so spend the, too much so, time. So, so the performance uh, in AI, you were talking mm -hmm. inferencing, training, or a combination of both. And the competition here is other GPUs or or, or other processors. I, I, I'm just trying to understand the 25X, for instance, uh, versus the competition on specific That's image CPUs. recognition algorithms. Yeah. Is that inferencing or training or both? That was, but that specifically was CPU and inferencing. We were comparing other CPUs and we were comparing it on inferencing. Uh, so you were comparing against other CPUs doing the same inferencing without DL boost? Yes. All right. And, 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 and the next line item was 20 different popular AI ML workloads, uh, roughly 50% better than competition. That too would be CPU versus CPU? That too would be CPU versus CPU. And again, uh, I, I, I need to look up the details on this one, but I believe yeah. most of them are really inference because when it, especially when it comes to the CPU, our focus is on inference, not as much on training. So do, do you mean that, uh, you know, the competition is not using the same instruction set? Yeah, for example, right, let's just take AMD. Uh, what they have is AVX2 at about half of the throughput, right? Now, what Intel has is AVX512, uh, so essentially think uh, closer to 4x the throughput. And then on top of that, we have DL Boost, which optimizes int 8, and that's what gives you the significant performance bump. Yeah, but, but uh, so, uh, do they have any, I don't know, uh, limitation in implementing in the next CPU uh, a a AVX uh, 512? I mean, uh, no, I mean, if you know, they it's, a, it's a generation yeah. problem of that they have. I mean, maybe they have something else that you don't have in your CPU. So mm -hmm. this is a race, no? So oh, it's next absolutely the iPhone is yeah. is better than my current one. I mean, yeah. and you can say the same with uh, with the. Uh, any other phone in the market. I mean, so the, the latest is the uh, is always the best. I mean, it's yeah. no. I, I don't expect uh, that the difference lasts too much. Six yeah. months, maybe. Yeah, it's an arms race, right? I mean, silicon maybe it's longer than six months because the silicon development timelines are longer. But again, uh, in more of an NDA conversation, you can kind of uh, see our roadmap to the future, right? Because our intention is it is an arms race. We fully expect that our competition will catch up. And as they catch up, we're doing more things and we expect to continue well, to maintain a lead because uh, we've started with the lead and we want to keep that lead. And yes, we are working hard yeah. on that. And we question, fully... question. Question on the, the, the lead. Uh, I, I'm an Intel fan, but some questions come to mind because we're talking a lot about features and I yeah. think we're missing the points about architecture that might be relevant to this. Uh, if I'm building a cloud environment, something that's going to matter to me a lot is core count. And it seems like the non-monolithic architectures are the ones that are excelling on this front. How, how is Intel going to counter that and maintain relevance when there are alternate mm -hmm. architectures that are able to achieve things like a much higher core count? Yeah, now some of this I cannot really talk in a public forum. So if we wanted to have a more detailed NDA conversation, yes, we definitely have uh, plans and uh, in our future roadmap. And we can also talk about uh, the instance to instance com uh, uh, comparisons, right? At the end of the day, uh, core count is about TCO, right? You get more cores per dollar. Uh, then you can deploy more containers or more VMs and uh, you get more VMs for your dollar. And I think uh, what I'll show you in a few foils is once you take the performance aspect into it on specific workloads, your perf per TCO per VM, you don't necessarily come out ahead just because you have more cores. The performance per core also matters. And we'll talk about that in a couple of foils. Uh, the next one on databases and scale out storages, I think we, uh, I, I won't belabor the opt-in stuff because uh, I think we had a detailed talk on that. Uh, but also the scalability to H socket and beyond gives you like significant database performance, more relevant to enterprise C workloads, but uh, that's another important part of our strategy to make sure we have database performance. 
And again, this is the uh, technologies, right? And all of these technologies, these were, these were driven by deep workload insights, right? Because as Intel, we've been working with end customers for a long time, right? Almost all of the features there, we've been working with big customers to uh, in, 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 include and enable, and this has been over a span of 10 years, right? On the processor side, we had we spoke about DL Boost for AI, AVX 512 for a wide set of HPC and AI and security instructions. We spoke about DDIO for networking. Uh, then, of course, we have skewing and we have speed select technology. I won't go through this laundry list because I know you have seen many talks with the Intel laundry list of features. But the point I wanted to make is uh, whether it's our processor or adjacencies like networking and uh, opt-in, uh, and uh, we are driven by workload insights that we work with customers on. And then we take that and enable the ecosystem with a broad set of hardware across a whole bunch of OEMs, broad set of VMs available, available across all of the CSPs, and uh, a bunch of ISVs who are also enabled for these solutions. So I think it's uh, basically, the point is we have a portfolio and we enable the ecosystem. And yes, there are some spaces where it's just about, okay, do I have the latest runtimes? But in a lot of workloads, that ecosystem matters. And that's one of the other points that we wanted to make in this one. And I'm happy to jump into anything specific, but I did not want to read everything on this file. All right, now let's, uh, uh, before I get into the competitive comparisons, I'm going to do some Graviton comparisons and some AMD comparisons. But before we jump in, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the micro architecture differences between like Ice Lake shown on the left and Milan shown on the right. <clears throat> right. Uh, as you know, right, Intel's, uh, we, we, the, the, in this generation, we stayed with this monolithic uh, architecture, right? We have up to uh, 40 cores in a monolithic die with eight memory controllers on the die. And we have UPI here connecting it to the two sockets. Uh, we have eight channels of memory as well, very similar to the competition. If you look at competition, they chose a slightly different approach. They have a, a centralized memory and IO die. So all of their eight memory channels come out of this. And then they have these uh, CPU dies with a smaller number of cores with a split L3. Now, there are trade-offs with the architectures, right? Uh, this one is uh, kind of, okay, you, are, you could argue that the CPU die is easier to build because it's a bunch of small dies that could be leveraged from client. But the trade-off there is now you have a greater latency to memory that I show here, right? They, uh, I think we can get to memory in 85 nanoseconds. For them, it takes 96 nanoseconds. Um, the remote socket, I think uh, we've done two socket pretty well for a long time. So on a remote socket, we can get to the remote socket uh, with 139 nanoseconds latency. And uh, it, it, and the other thing that I, is not called out on this foil is when you think about the split L3 versus the unified LLC, uh, if your software is not super optimized and you have a virtual machine that spans dies, if you miss in your local L3 and have to go to the remote L3, you're looking at latencies that are pretty close to DRAM latencies to just get to the cache, right? And so that's one of the trade-offs of having a split L3 versus a unified LLC. And what we believe is that having the unified LLC allows us to scale the workloads from small workloads all the way to large workloads without trade-offs. So that's why when you look at a benchmark comparison and say something like spec and trade, that one, these architecture differences won't even show up on that benchmark. But when you run real workloads, that performance difference will show up. I have a question about this comparison, especially in terms of power consumption. In mm -hmm. a lot of parts of the world, power is pretty expensive for data centers, so it plays yep. a big role. How much cycles per wattage you have? Do you have something mm -hmm. on that? So to, to, to power consumption, right, I think there are two things. One is, what does the microarchitecture doing for the power? And the second is, what's the process node doing for the power? Now. Clearly having multiple dyes and having to uh, consume the power of going from die to die is a trade-off in terms of it's going to consume a little more power, but then competition is currently on a newer process node. So that offsets that. And so they end up having a better performance for what? But that's an area where uh, at least on as measured by spec and trade. But this is where if you now start looking at performance per watt as measured by 
uh, real world workloads. So let's take uh, AI, let's take some of the scale out databases and we'll get into some of those comparisons. Uh, the effort per watt will be different. And this is where I think we are also making sure that uh, customers understand that if you just use the benchmark, it'll look like the performance for what is a lot better in competition. But if you use real workloads, that is not the case. I have to ask this question because, uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, I get it up to a certain point. Uh, mm -hmm. So I totally get the architecture uh, mm -hmm. of the CPU. And uh, my problem is people don't really buy CPUs, they buy servers in the end. Yes. And uh, benchmarks of AMD are pretty good at the moment. I'm not saying that they are, you know, they, they will last long. I mean, you will mm -hmm. have an, a next generation CPU that will yeah. be faster. So, that's right. but, but at the moment, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, you can say to me that uh, memory or whatever, it's faster on your CPU, but actually uh, we saw so many benchmarks lately published mm -hmm. probably, you know, by, uh, by AMD itself, but Nonetheless, they are good. Yeah, they are. And maybe let's jump into some comparisons, right? Uh, that's what I was going to do next. And uh, let's actually evaluate those comparisons and see if they're actually good, right? And when we do those comparisons, we're going to make sure that the, uh, like VNNI and AVX 512 and Vector AES and the SHA instructions and BBMI, right? There are a bunch of things, and when you do these benchmarks, you have to use the right libraries, right? If you and you have to enable the right features, and you have to use the right SKUs, and you have to use the right settings, right? So lots of games and benchmarks. We just have to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples. And when we do that, right? So let me first do a performance comparison of Intel Xeon M5 instances, which are actually Cascade Lake, with the Graviton instances, which are this is not even Ice Lake comparison. Ice Lake will actually look a lot better. And in the next page, I'll actually compare AMD. So I think maybe this will kind of help answer some of those questions. Now, if you take Graviton, right? The initial claim was AWS claimed 40% better price performance with Graviton 2. And they showed some benchmark numbers. Now, we took all of those claims and tried to rerun these numbers, right? And if you look at the appendix in this deck that'll go out, you'll see all of the details and what are the configurations and so on in order to be able to recreate it. But uh, what we did is we started off with, okay, let's call the M6G 1.0. Let's set that as the baseline. And we picked a 16X large instance. So that's the baseline. And then we looked at a bunch of uh, <clears throat> uh, workloads. We looked at databases. We used MySQL, HammerDB. We used PostgreSQL, HammerDB. We did MongoDB. Now on databases, right, the M6, uh, the M5 instance, which is a Cascade Lake instance, is actually... Uh, 60 to 70 percent, 75 percent better on um, HammerDB, and even on MongoDB, it was 20 percent better. Now, if you go to the just web and Java and just standard web tier applications, again, the instance, uh, if you compare it, right, we are anywhere from, I guess, 20 percent in Java, slightly better on WordPress, and over 60 percent better ASP.NET. If you look at compute throughput, right, uh, spec in with an optimized compiler, then again, 30, 20, 30 percent better. If you look at single threaded perf, just pure single threaded perf, again, you can see that we are significantly better, 50 to 80 percent. Uh, so it, it, you can see that even an older Intel instance leads a Graviton instance for a variety of workload. So it, even, an, and you could say, okay, what about price per dollar? And even if you take a typical 20 percent discount with a Graviton 2 instance, uh, you'll still come out ahead on per, uh, perf per dollar for a variety of workloads. Even setting aside all of the porting and software maintenance and the other costs we were talking about, right? Even setting all of those aside, the price per dollar, the uh, performance per dollar, uh, it, it is not what was originally claimed, right? When you actually uh, run it in these scenarios. And again, we, we, we did pick a broad set of workloads, right? We didn't pick just the workloads that we're really good at, like AI. We picked just databases and web. And even there, you're doing pretty good. The, the bit I'm sort of struggling with is part of what you were talking about earlier is that customers want to have flexibility and choice. Yes. Which, okay, fine. Um, and but but you're also sort of saying Intel's good at everything, which is a bit of a concern for me. And like in some of this, you're saying, "Oh, look, we're we're actually sort of vaguely comparable. We're kind of the same on on some of these things." Um, yeah, I, I think the point I was making there is on some of these stuff. 
uh, we are not like forty uh, percent behind on price perf, right? You're actually uh, in some cases we are about the same, or in some cases we are actually ahead by quite a bit. And then when it comes to things like AI and so on, we are significantly better. So if you want to buy as few types of systems as possible, or as few types of VMs as possible, for example, let's say you're buying. 10,000 reserved VMs and want to use that for a variety of purposes. Uh, the case I'm making is, well, you're better off buying the Intel VM because not only are we good at this stuff, uh, we're really good at other stuff that you also need to do, like the AI workloads and so on. Okay. Makes okay. sense? Because that, <clears throat> yeah. th that makes sense to me and that, like that yeah. that's stronger because that's the stuff I actually care about. Yeah. Speeds and feeds is a bit, uh, to be honest, it feels a bit defensive and I don't think you need mm. to because, like you're saying, you're really good at certain things. Yeah. And the reason that I would say, like, because of flexibility and choice, I want to be able to change my mind and not have to completely re-architect my whole cloud infrastructure yes. that mm. I purchase and say, actually, you know what? Turns out I don't actually need as much of that stuff. Let's put some other workloads on there without having to completely redo everything. Yes. Because that will burn all of the, like, yeah, okay, great. I save 40 cents or, you know, 40 cents, oh. a, a, I don't know, a TPU or something. And I just burned all of that with EA costs and labor costs because I've got a team of six people who have to redesign everything for three months. Yeah. And, and the other that thing to is, me is a stronger this. argument, which isn't really coming through. Okay. Now that's a fair point. And maybe next iteration, we'll try and strengthen that aspect. Um, I think uh, we were also trying to dive into the architecture and so on a little bit, but you're absolutely right. From a customer perspective, this is what matters. Yeah, and the other thing that you mentioned, right? So uh, it, not only do you get performance that's comparable or better, you also can get the same VM instance on pretty much any cloud in the world and run the same workload. So you will not get locked into a cloud uh, if you pick Intel. So that's the other point that would be helpful, I think, from a customer perspective. And the next one is let's jump into AMD, right? Um, again, uh, let, uh, we're looking at HPC workloads, uh, cloud workloads, and then AI inference. You can see that on HPC workloads, uh, once you start using AVX 512, so we use Linfac, we use NAMD, so pretty standard HPC benchmarks. Uh, we are actually doing pretty good. And uh, this is comparing a 40-core uh, Ice Lake with an AMD Epic uh, 7763, and it's a 64-core. So we're comparing 40 of Intel cores to 64 of AMD's cores. And you can see that we actually do better on all of these benchmarks, even with a fewer number of cores. You can see that on a web server, right? once you realize that web is web has, crypto is ubiquitous to any web workload, right? Once you realize that, and once you actually make use of those crypto instructions, which we are actually upstreaming to OpenSSL and uh, things like that, uh, you can see that we are significantly better, like two to three X better. And, uh, and if you look at AI inference, right, we already spoke about this, uh, depending on what type of model we're talking about, uh, the extreme case is mobile net, where you're doing significantly better, like uh, 25x. And even on a something like BERT, which is used for language processing, we're doing about uh, the two to three x better. And again, the, the two lines are in one case, it's a uh, batch inference, where we're doing lots of background inference uh, tasks with a much larger batch size. Uh, but there's the dark blue bar is actually the more interesting one because that's the that's the case that's happening all the time. That's real time inference, right? That's what happens. For example, when you speak into your Alexa, you're expecting a response within a certain latency, right? Uh, you cannot batch that up and uh, and wait for it to get done. So for real time inference, we're actually doing really well because of the AI features in the CPU. So there are many inference cases where you don't even need to consider an accelerator. You can do that in the CPU really well. And the point is, uh, we are good at HPC, we are pretty good in cloud, and we are significantly better in AI inference. And we have, I don't know, thousands of Intel instances all over the world. Therefore, you should pick Intel. That's the case. So, so one of the questions on the AI side is, is, is how much of that is associated with the DL boost functionality versus the better performance per core, let's say, or something like that? I mean, I, it's, it's, so, I mean, you're comparing Intel with DL Boost, right? Against AMD without. 
DL boost. Uh, right? uh, we are comparing the best Intel is capable of with the AVX2 on AMD, right? Because the best they have. So, yeah, but they don't have DL boost. So we thought it was a fair comparison. Uh, but you're right. And a big chunk of this improvement, some of it is from performance per core, but a big chunk of this is going to be from DL boost. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not familiar with AMD. Do they have something that you don't have? I mean, and I, and I shouldn't ask to you, but actually, I'm pretty sure they have some uh, announcement or to their CPUs to make some workloads better. I mean, or, or do they stick? You know, are, are all are they always a step behind you because you are the one mm -hmm. the, that defines the instruction set and they can only copy? And I'm asking here because I. I um. I don't know how it works. I think, I mean, I'll, I should let AMD speak for themselves. But right now, I would say that in terms of the enhanced instructions, uh, we, are, we, we are way ahead. I think uh, there was a time in the past when AMD got ahead in virtualization a little bit in one generation, and then uh, we had to catch up, and then we got ahead again. Mm -hmm. But right as of now, I think when you talk about AI workloads and HPC workloads and so on, uh, I, I, I think they're behind and may, have, may be a choice they made because they're... Uh, I don't know, prioritizing scalar performance over vector, but uh, uh, as of now, I would contend that they're behind in terms of workload specific performance and more focused on just general purpose scalar performance. Okay, so so they they provide a uh, uh, high speed core <laughs> for you know general purpose uh, stuff, but as soon as you get into you know something very specific, all yeah. the optimizations make make a difference. Yes, exactly. If I can, if I can jump on that, that what what uh, Enrico was saying is exactly something which I'm seeing in the field. And my, my <clears throat> point there was, uh, there are some some large organizations which still have a significant on-premises footprint, you know, in terms of x86 workloads, mm -hmm. general purpose stuff, virtualization, etc. So how are you positioning? your own you know uh, processors mm -hmm. against what amd is doing because obviously amd seems to be getting an edge in that area and i don't know if that's an area which is you know important mm -hmm. for your business or if you're already looking beyond towards something else yeah uh, i think the case we're making there is that the general compute servers the general purpose servers aren't running just scalar code or just just running integer code right they're having to do crypto. They're having to do some AI because everyone's infusing AI into all of their apps. So even uh, I, I think the new general compute is not just integer code. It is some AI. It's some integer code. It's some vector code. It's some graph processing. Once you put that all together, um, you're so better off. So maybe, maybe I need to clarify what I had in mind was, you know, uh, old school mm -hmm. legacy virtualization. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe could you say more on the type of applications there? Okay, can I ask you an, yeah. another question yeah. around the overall efficiency of the system? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, what you know, C CPU from the point of view of the CPU, okay, you are adding a lot of uh, uh, features, okay. That yeah. features, you know, means transistors in the end, and mm -hmm. means also a lot of uh, power consumption. Yeah, uh, while. AMD probably is less uh, efficient from the number of instructions that they have, but they are more efficient from the power consumption point of view, and, mm -hmm. and potentially from the from the um, uh, from the fact that they have a you know a process that is ten nanometers now, if I'm not wrong. So, yeah. I mean, what is the comparison? I can throw a couple of servers more if necessary. For example, if the difference mm -hmm. is not that much because everything is scaled out today. So in the end, if I look at a very large infrastructure, mm -hmm. does it really make a difference to have DL boost? Uh, I think it's going to depend on the mix of workloads, right? If you're a digital services provider, like uh, running, uh, doing recommendations and so on, DL boost is going to make a lot of sense, right? Um, if all you're running is some low level integer data moving, moving code, so maybe you'd prioritize, you know what, I just want a lot more simple cores. So are there applications for that? Yes, sure, right? Uh, but then you get look at aggregate across the data center. Do you want to buy that type of core for one set of workloads and another type of core for the other workloads that need it? Or do you just want to buy this one set of cores that can do everything, right? That's the trade-off. You can bifurcate your infrastructure, but when you bifurcate your infrastructure, now you have 
two sets of platforms to qualify. You have two sets of uh, software stacks to qualify and so on. So that's the trade-off you'll have to make is, uh, is there a portion of your workload that's only integer? And would you buy something more optimized for that? Yeah, that is a choice you could make, but then that comes with the trade-offs. And then I'm actually pretty much getting to the last foil, right? I think one of the things I also wanted to make sure is each of the ARM SOC is proprietary to its vendors, right? So I think uh, in terms of what is the cache hierarchy, what's the fabric look like, what are the latencies across the fabric, your performance tuning will vary based on which ARM SOC you pick. So I think well, that's one of the things that we try to do well is consistent and predictable performance, regardless of where you run. You run in the cloud, run on-prem, run on cloud one, run on cloud two. You can expect similar performance for a similar VM. Um, the other thing that we want to make sure that uh, folks understand is when performance claims come out, right? We should uh, kind of evaluate them carefully. Are the details documented? Are the configuration and information uh, detailed enough where you can repeat these results in your lab and are they relevant to real world workloads? And that's why I showed some examples that were a little more relevant and the appendix has details on how to recreate that. Um, again, we already spoke about the ecosystem and allows, because of our ecosystem impact, we can deploy a lot more flexible options across uh, clouds and across on-prem and edge locations. And we are also asking customers to urge the just the CapEx savings against overall TCO, conversion cost, lock-in risk, some of the exact themes that I kept uh, touching upon during the talk. So. In summary, right, I think we think customers should choose IA because it's proven. It's performant across workloads that really matter and across the broad set of workloads. Uh, and you have a robust software ecosystem. And you can buy our servers from such a large variety of OEM and OXM and solution partners. And, whether, and you can rent our VM instances across a variety of clouds, and you can get all types of VM instances across these clouds, right? As an example, I think. Uh, uh, latest, last we counted, there were 50,000 different Intel VM types available across all of the different uh, clouds in the world. And I think our competition's numbers in the hundreds right now. So we recently heard some uh, word from Intel about uh, RISC-V and how that was going to be integrated as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a new line uh, or what do we, what can you say about uh, Intel and RISC-V versus x86? Oh, so as of now, right, we've been risk five. Uh, Sci five is an uh, uh, Intel Capital is an investor in Sci five. Uh, you might you must have heard of the whole IDM 2.0 announcement as well recently, where we are starting to kind of make silicon for others. So that whole risk five announcement you saw was uh, Sci five being a customer of Intel trying to get their part fabbed at Intel. So this is an IDM 2.0 thing where. We are actually having a fabbing something for in our leading edge node for an external customer. So it's not an Intel product, it's a sci-fi product and we are the foundry for them. And this is part of the IDM 2.0 efforts. And this doesn't change anything in our standard roadmap on Xeon. I mean, we'll be, we're always evaluating stuff like this, but as of now, this is just, this is just sci-fi as Intel's customer in the foundry. So you didn't talk as much about ARM, and obviously that's another one of the rising mm -hmm. competitors in the cloud data center. Uh, do you see that as, uh, do you see the competition with ARM similarly to the way that you see it with AMD? Um, I think it's, a, uh, if I see ARM, I, I, I view the dynamics a little differently. Again, this is my personal view, is uh, and AMD is again, x86, broad merchant, and uh, kind of trying to approach the market similar to Intel. If I look at ARM in the cloud, right, uh, where it started is like verticalized silicon from AWS, where they built their own SOC, right? And uh, in, that ter in terms of that, it's a much more kind of bespoken architecture, very specific to one customer. And as long as that uh, provider has the wherewithal to enable the stacks and enable everything to uh, make it work, uh, then uh, you can use it easily. But otherwise, you're going to have trouble. You're going to get locked in. You're going to have trouble moving across and so on. So I think this area is going to evolve. Yes, we have competitors showing up in the ARM merchant space as well. But I think it's yet to be seen if this becomes a 
de facto standard architecture across clouds, or if this becomes a bespoken, I want to create my own vertical walled garden and I'm going to use ARM to do it. I think that's, we, we should see how that plays out. Can I ask you an additional question about all, because I'm struggling a little bit. So DL Boost uh, was introduced the last year, right? It was introduced, yes, in Cascade Lake first. Okay, so uh, it's a, still a small amount of CPUs that have this uh, functionality. And you need yes. a specialized, you know, you need to recompile your software to take advantage of it. Uh, not necessarily recompile your software. You just have to use the TensorFlow version, for example, that uses, I mean, it depends on how you're using the Elbows. If you're using MKL DNM, or if you're using a framework, you can take advantage of it without having to recompile anything. But if you're actually using the ISA, yes, then you'll have to recompile. But our recommended way of using DL Boost is either through MKL DNN libraries or through mm -hmm. using frameworks directly, like TensorFlow. Okay, so every every single you know framework out there already can take advantage of DL Boost. Pretty uh, and not every single framework. I know we've spent a good bit of time with TensorFlow. Let's say TensorFlow. Uh, so if I use yeah. TensorFlow, I don't yeah. do, I don't need anything. I mean, uh, I just jump from AMD to Intel and it goes faster. Yeah, as long as you're using the right version of TensorFlow, yes. Yeah, the so, latest. And even if you're using the right version of TensorFlow, right? Whether you're using, let's say you're running uh, on a Cascade Lake on one instance and you're running on a Sky Lake on another instance, uh, it, the, when you use TensorFlow with MKL DNN, it'll automatically figure out which CPU you're using. And if it's uh, Cascade Lake, you'll use the capabilities that are presented in Cascade Lake. If it's Sky Lake, uh, you'll just fall back on the AVX 512 path. 